leader of the Green Party has popped into the studio to talk to me, uh, Eamon Ryan. Deputy Eamon Ryan, welcome to the bar- program. Good morning, George. I've had two, so I'm, I'm halfway there. As well. <laughs> so we're not going to mention cyclists or climate change or anything, but we are going to mention something that you have specific knowledge of because you went to Egypt mm. in the case of, of this young man, which you might tell me about. Yeah, Ibrahim Halala, we were expecting him to be released today. We were, we were expecting a verdict, rather, in his trial and that following that verdict, the president of Egypt would live up to his commitment when we were there, uh, that following the verdict, he would get a presidential pardon and would our president de- de- decree to allow him a uh, return to Ireland. Now, unfortunately, for what uh, we don't know the full details yet, so he's coming back out from Egypt, it's been postponed for another three weeks. And I suppose that's characterised the whole court carrying, just very broadly to, to remind your, your listeners, Ibrahim was, um, he, he was 17 back four years ago when he was arrested at, in the Raqqa Mosque, which is in the centre of Cairo. There was um, a counter-revolution at the time against, if you remember, in the Arab Spring, e- Egypt in 2011, uh, there was an uprising. They got rid of Mu- Mu- Mubarak, the then president. It was replaced by President Morsi, who was with the Muslim kind of um, government. And he was in power for two years before a further counter-revolution saw a return, effectively, the army to power. Um, over one and a half thousand people were killed okay. on the streets. Ibrahim was with his sisters in Raqqa Mosque in the centre, involved in protests, everyone kind of acknowledges, but in peaceful protests, not no, involved. But hold on one now, Deputy Ryan. Uh, you know, you're kind of dismissing protests here. Mm. It was okay, it was just protesting. But, like, we mightn't take too kindly if an Egyptian came over here and started protesting in O'Connell Street about whatever it happened to be about our government or our, our, our democracy or whatever it happened to be. By the lights of a country, which is a very different democracy to ours. I mean, you can't use the kind of standards of law and everything that we have to Egypt. Uh, certain rights are universal. I, I think the right to political demonstration, to protest is, is universal. Um, there is nothing in the trial that's t- taken place over the last four years and, and the trial has been postponed about 27 times. Today isn't the only example. It's been almost yeah, exactly. symbolic. And there's been no ev- evidence presented, and I don't believe there is, that Ibrahim uh, was involved in any way in violent protest. I had a 17-year-old, uh, I have a 17-year-old, they're, they're engaged in all sorts of protest and political... Uh, you want 17-year-olds to be engaged politically. You have the right to, 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 be, to be engaged. You don't then expect that they're going to be locked up for four years. In a mass trial with 493 other defendants, those are basic rights. And yes, we have to be sensitive in terms of recognising the independence of judicial law, of the laws in Egypt and, and to a certain extent the Irish government the way they've approached this and to certain, uh, say, OK, we will wait until, uh, given that we failed to be able to get him out of court in the, during the process, it's okay, we'll respect the Egyptian legal process, come to an end and then we'll get a release. But the problem is that that has now been postponed yet again. No, but uh, you see, uh, I, lest anybody think I want the young man locked up for mm. the rest of it, that's not true at all. What I'm actually saying is, and I think you're reinforcing it in a sense, you're applying our legal traditions and our democracy to countries, uh, this time it's Egypt, to countries that have none of them, uh, those kind of democracies. I mean, if your son was 17 years of age and he happened to be Jewish, you wouldn't have said being happy if he'd gone over to Berlin with a placard, you know, because you would have said, listen, you're going to be in trouble, they're going to lock you up and they're going to throw away the key. Similarly, look what happened to whites uh, who were on those Freedom Riders. Do you remember them in mm. the 60s who went into the south of America to protest mm. against uh, uh, the, that there wasn't racial integration? They were murdered by the local sheriff. So, like, you, you, these things do happen no matter how they much do, we like I? it. And we, we can't... The Egyptians couldn't give a fig, really, about the West. Yeah, but we have to concern... This is an Irish citizen. That's why we have an interest. No, I, correct. So, 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 point, so yeah. it's an Irish citizen in the middle. So you've got to look after after his rights, but also to say in representing his rights, I think there's a certain position we take. Firstly, we are different to the French or the English and others are, who've got a colonial tradition. You've got to be careful. We don't go in with our big imperialist boots and say, Egypt, you do this, you do that. You have to recognise that they have certain, you know, they're an independent dem- country just like we are. And in fact, we have a lot of kind of a uh, common history in the sense that they sought their Arab independence the same time we were seeking our independence from the British. So we actually have a good relationship. 
and in those in, in that world you okay you don't go into two big boots saying telling them what to do but you do in standing up for certain basic rights that's part of what we are as a country we stand up for yeah. certain things we actually we're part of the United Nations we're part of the, in Geneva the international courts we do America doesn't America's not even part of the international courts we are we stand for certain basic rights we stand up for our citizens and I think it particularly uh, in, in, in this case while it's it's important that we stand up for Irish citizens well, the, the, the point about this though is he, he was the Muslim Brotherhood for which he was involved and there's no doubt that he was involved and the mosque from which he comes where his father is the imam uh, is also uh, I have to choose my words carefully, but certainly is a is a political mosque and has uh, has strong political views. So therefore, he went to Egypt in the time of uh, a major political upheaval, and he decided to demonstrate. And then he he cannot be surprised the Egyptians, whether he was Irish or Egyptian, didn't take too kindly to us. And he's paid a very, I mean, he's paid an unfair price, but that. The price he paid. Paid. I don't believe he's involved with the Muslim Brotherhood or, or, or that. I mean, and in relation but that's to why there's a court to case now. Hold on, is, the but, verdict I, hasn't been released. No, yet. but. Uh, uh, I believe he'll be innocent of any charges of, or should be seen as innocent from any charges uh, of violent protest. Um, I, I tend the mosque down in Klansky a fair bit. I, I, I live pl- close to it. I go there for lunch. That's a very, it's a very good restaurant. And I visited the imam and I visited, uh, was there for the 20th anniversary of the mosque last year, along with other political leaders, Miel Martin and a number of other, politi- all the polit- political parties were there. And uh, we have, I think, in this country, done reasonably well in maintaining good relationships and in actually... What we don't want to go is down the road of extremists and where you get the kind of terrorism. And I think to a certain extent, that's one of the reasons why it's important we stand up for our Irish Muslim citizens and treat them the exact same well, way as everyone else. Let's take, and a, I think no, no, let's take a little step different. There is no doubt that the greatest blot on the, on, on the eight years of the Obama administration mm. was his massive miscalculation in relation to the Arab Spring and everything else in, in North Africa. And he may well have, in fact, created or at least fanned the flames of ISIS. Now, we can turn around and say, okay, they've taken a long time to reach a verdict, but we haven't got a verdict. So what about if in this final, final uh, verdict they say, well, this guy is guilty. Uh, What do you do then? He gets a presidential pardon. Can I say, in terms of Obama's history, one of the interesting things where we were there in Cairo, and we had very good meetings with the president, with the party of the parliament, interior ministry, the head of everything, really. And one of the things they were saying all the time is, hold on a sec, he says, you look at our country. He says, to our east, we have Syria in flames. To our south, we have Iraq and and Yemen and Sudan in flames. And to our west, we have Libya in flames. A lot of those countries are in flames because the West actually intervened in Libya, in Iraq. Correct. And and actually helped create the conditions that lead into the breakdown there. I would say, actually, when it comes to President Obama, the the blot in his history, one of the main ones would be the continuation or the escalation, indeed, of drone warfare, where we're still engaging in a military bombing approach to try to, to look for solutions in the Middle East. I don't believe that's the right way to go. I think actually an Irish perspective was interesting when we were, I, I think I said it was this, this to you before, George, when I was in, uh, when I came back from Cairo in that visit, the head of the Arab League said to us, said, you Irish are different. Before you stood the line, you held the line in South Lebanon when the Israeli militias came to attack the local population, you stood the line with your blue helmets and you said, you shall not pass. And I think to a certain extent are standing up for someone the likes of Ibrahim, which is standing up for basic rights without being holier than thou and kind of preachy and, and kind of going down in a heavy, because we don't have the power anyway to be imperialist, but actually in a standing up in a diplomatic way is an important part of actually what would be a better approach to the Middle East, because throwing money, throwing weapons, throwing bombs at it doesn't work. Standing up for basic rights But but hold a while though. You you said the words universal and rights. Mm. There aren't universal rights. I mean, as a listener reminds me, try this in North Korea or China, or try it in Egypt. I mean, if the two of us sat down over another one of these 
coffees that you and I should have, we might come up with 25 countries where the kind of rights that we take for granted do not exist. The UN Charter of Fundamental Rights, I think, do give a broad outline. And I think the Israeli government or the Israeli courts themselves would say, that, and they did say to us, it says we have to stand up for basic rights. Now, now, now there are, you can certain rights and you can emphasize, but one of the ones I think that is recognized is that mass trials is that ongoing detention, particularly for 17 year olds without the evidence being heard, without a case being taken place. That's in any legal system, including the Egyptians' own legal charter and their own charter of rights. OK, is not, is well, not correct. For, for me and for everybody listening, why do you think they have done this? I think it is probably, um, well, firstly, I mean, you know, and, and it is complex in that country. Like you have judges being murdered in that country. You have bombs going off in the Coptic Church and in other places, Christians being attacked. You have communities. Uh, ISIS is active. And uh, and uh, in those circumstances, are probably, I think, a judicial and a political system, they're cracking down hard and they are imprisoning. They're doing mass trials and, uh, and engaged in all sorts of measures that are completely... But he, uh, Abraham uh, Lira is, it, 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 is only a pawn in all this. Like there are hundreds of... Thousands, you, thousands. You've been there. Thousands mm. in jail. Yes. It, the thing is, he's lucky that, in fact, he's carrying an Irish passport and he has a government and people in Dolair who care about him. If he, there's, there's thousands that nobody cares about are it's, unknown. No, it's true. It's very true. He's, I don't think... I, I don't feel lucky this morning. Like he probably no, thought no, he woke yeah. up this morning and thought, I'm going to be flying home at last. And now he's going back to the cell with 20 other inmates. And it was interesting. There was a colleague of my friend um, involved who had been involved with Greenpeace. He, he was recently arrested up in the Arctic. Uh, they were protesting against Russian um, uh, exploration in the Arctic. They were arrested and locked up for three or four months. Now, these people went into it knowing what they were doing with high risk of being arrested and blocked up. They suffered huge mental health difficulties, I think particularly for a younger man. And that yoing of, of kind of expectation of being released Correct. and dashed, that's one of the hardest things. And I'd say for him today, that's a crushing blow because another three weeks, um, please God, will be out at the end of that. Uh, You're also assuming, I must say, that the president is going to live up to his promise and give him a presidential pardon. You're, you're making a, I suggest to you, you're making a very big assumption. We had a 45-minute meeting with them and it was the only item on the agenda and there was a very clear commitment given, so I, I, okay. I, I have to imagine you will. Well, interestingly, my next guest, in fact, is Chairman of... 